the brother has been researching about Islam for one year, and alhamdulillah, he wishes to embrace Islam. I'll ask our Sheikh, our Qari, our Kasha Kamini, to welcome this brother to the religion of Islam. Allahu Akbar. Is it okay? Uh, the brother, his name is Defense. That's his name, Defense. Isn't that something? That's a beautiful name, brother. That's a nice name. Defense came to embrace Islam. He heard about it, and he's excited to join. The 7.1 million or billion people around the world to be Muslim today. Allahu Akbar. Brother Defense, Muslims, our scripture teaches us that for you to be a Muslim is only few words that you will say and acknowledge. And once you say them, you're into the religion. We don't have a um, pool behind you know, our masks to dip yourself in it like churches do. So you say those words, we explain the words to you, and it's over. you just like one of us right here and even better. Because we are informed that when you embrace Islam, you have a gift from your creator. That gift is all what you've done in the past all the shortcomings that had happened from you between you and God, he will forgive everything. Isn't that something great? It's great. Can you hold it up? Isn't that great? It's great. It's great, right? You love it. Yeah, I love it. So everything will be forgiven. God will not ask you for what you've done. You will have a white page from today Amen. going forward. Amen, Amen right? Good. The amen that we said in the church, we said it amen, almost similar. Okay? But if there is a business between you and somebody and you're holding his money, that one you have to give it back. <laughs> that one is not between you and God. You pay him back, and whatever is between you and people, that's between you and people. But between you and God is wiped. So I want you to repeat after me, defense. Ashhadu. Ashhadu Ashhadu Allah Allah Ilaha Ilaha Illallah Illallah Wa ashhadu Wa ashhadu Anna Anna Muhammadan Muhammadan Rasulu Rasulu Allah Allah The meaning of what we said is I be a witness that there is none that is worthy of worship except Allah my creator and the creator of the world and universe. Do you accept that? I accept. And that from today, you will never bow down, prostrate, or worship other than God. Do you accept that? I accept. The one who created you is worthy of your worship, and you will never worship somebody else. Do you acknowledge it? I acknowledge it. And that he sent a guide to the world. His name is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. Peace be upon him. He will be your guide. Whatever you do must be according to what he left as a legacy, not what people do. If you see Muslim say something that you don't like, that's between you and that Muslim. But that leader is your guide. Do you accept him? I accept. Allahu Akbar. Allah. Allahu Akbar. Allah. So once you embrace these two words, that's it, you are a Muslim. Now you are new. Were you to die right now, I'm not saying you're going to die right now. <laughs> Were you to die right now, guess what? You're going to heaven straight. Allah Akbar. Allahu Akbar. You're going to heaven straight just by what? Proclaiming these words. So we appreciate you converting or reverting back to the faith and also being a Muslim. You know, brothers, if someone can hold them, you're going to be in the crowd, right? 
Okay, so brothers, you get his contact. We talk later on in details, and we appreciate you coming defense and be on defense. <laughs> About the name that's between him, that, that defense, if you want to change from defense to offense, that's something else. Later on, we talk about that. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Barakallahu feekum. Takbir. Takbir. Before I welcome the Sheikh, there's a question I asked. There's the Masih Dajjal. He'll be here for 40 days. The first day is equivalent to one year, the second day one month, the third day one week, and the other 37 days no more. This is the worst fitna from the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam until the day of judgment. Why is this great fitna, great evil, not mentioned in the Quran? I always forget to answer this question and I ask it every single time. There's a time I asked in a mosque, I didn't come to that mosque for one year. And brothers were asking me three months later, four months later. Should I do the same thing here? <laughs> Allah Akbar. Taib. The ulama, they say, number one, just to conclude, where is the shaykh gone? Bismillah. Just to conclude, they say, tahqiru mishani. Just to keep his affairs very, to, 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 insignificant. To make his affairs insignificant. Number two, the, the scholars of Arabic language say, because the true Messiah, the Isa has been mentioned in the Quran, there's no need to mention his opposite. His opposite, opposite is also understood. And number three, he is mentioned in, some, in a general sense in the verses that talk about uh, the signs of the day of judgment. So inshallah, brothers in Islam, let us welcome our next lecture, our next lecturer, Sheikh Okasha Kameni. He'll be talking about the importance of Quran in our lives. And Sheikh Okasha, there's a specific request from the majority of the brothers and the sisters. A specific request is that they're requesting for you to recite for them the words of Allah Azza wa Jal in the different qiraat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed upon you. That is the request for the majority of the brothers. Is that true? Taib, faliyatafaddal mashkura. Can you take your tissue? Uh, Sheikh Mahmoud just told me that the consensus among the people of knowledge and also Sheikh Saeed is that we finish the lecture and then once we sit you know, together to conclude, um, we recite the verses of Quran to conclude the um, convention with. So this is what came from them, and I hope you all agree with them. If you all don't agree, I agree with them. <laughs> so inshallah, the recitation will come towards the end, bi'idhnillah. Uh, brothers, if you all don't mind, this pen, can we take it somewhere? Because you see, I move like Bruce Lee, I may kick it. Yeah, yeah, d down like that. You know, yet, man, once I stretch my leg, it may side kick it. And I don't want to side kick and mess, mess it up. Show us how you do it. Okay. Uh, how many minutes do I have? 45? I'm setting my clock so that you know I can keep up. There's, there's no need for reminder. Uh, usually I warm up after 45 minutes. So they gave me 45, so I have to set and warm up quickly. Alhamdulillah. Zil jalali wal ikram, wa tawli wal inaam. له الحمد ما تليت الأنفال ورست الجبال وهبت الشمال وتعاقبت الأيام والليال أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أيد الإسلام بمبعث سيد الأنام 
دعا أمم الأرضين من بعد فترة تطاول في ليل الضلال رقودها يقول لليل الكفر إذ طال ليله ألا أيها الليل الطويل ألا جلي وما زال يدعو كل جأب فؤاده كجلمود صخر حطاه السيل من علي إلى أن أجابت عن رجاء ورحبة ومن شرك الإشراك حلت قيودها فقيد إلى الإيمان طوعا منيبها وسيق له بالهندوان عنيدها فأقمر ليلها بعد سودادي وأيسر حالها في خير حالي أقسم برب الورى ما ضل وما غوى وما ينطق عن الهوى إن هو إلا وحي يوحى سبقت به البشرى ونزل فيه وعليه سبحان الذي أسرى ساد الورى بلا امترى حين افترى عظم الورى فهو المجلي والورى إلى ورى صلى عليه الله ما وبل هما وما قام عبد في كنياكم وسعى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وبعد Brothers in faith, sisters in Islam I commence by praising Almighty the supreme, the sovereign, the omnipotent, the ever-compelling, and the only ruler of the universe to whom everything is ought to be obedient. Sublime is he, and exalted be he. And upon the seal of all prophets and messengers Muhammad, we send the sincerest salutations and the purest prayer. O cherisher of the world, allow thy prayer to envelop his household and his disciples right along with them. On the top of the list, التيم العدوي القرشي الهاشم السعد السعيد الطلح الزبير العوف الفهري and those who had espoused their legacy and the posterity to follow them in both adversity and prosperity. قوم كرام السجايا أينما ذكروا ابقى المكان على آثارهم عطرا. The topic of the day after empowerment of our youth is the importance of Quran in our lives. The importance of Quran in our lives. Simply conceptualize with me or visualize with me. We wake up one day early in the morning. We come out of our houses. We look out. There is no earth and no sky. The sky that is rooted as a canopy. We look outside, no sky. And we look beneath. There is no earth outspread. What will happen to us on that day? I ask you a question. You don't answer, I ask the sisters. What will happen? We wake up one day, no sky, no earth. What will happen to us? Can we survive? Well, the world without Quran is more tragic and more dangerous than what I just mentioned. As a Muslim, Without Quran in your life, without Quran in our lives, it's just like the world without canopy. It's just like the world without sky. It's just like earth without being outspread. We are just suspended in the air. How can we survive? Impossible conclusively. So we, mankind, Muslims or none, without the scripture of Almighty, it's just like we are suspended. No air for us to breathe, no earth for us to step on, and no sky to serve as a canopy. Because Quran is nothing in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, save that which is given to Jibreel, to our prophet, peace be upon him, to save all of us, Muslims and none, from darkness to light, from confusion to constructive, you know, future and ascendancy. That's what Quran is all about. Without Quran, we can survive. Without Quran, what will you recite when you go to the masjid in prayer? How can you govern your life? So Quran is more important in our lives than the air that we breathe, than the food that we eat, than the water that we drink, than our own souls. That's how Quran was given to the seal of all prophets and messengers. Before the revelation of this book, people were confused, deep dejection, 
air of melancholy hover on them. People did not know their direction. They didn't know what will be good for them in both lives, here and the hereafter. So when Quran came, those who were confused, now they know the direction that they're supposed to embark upon. Those who did not know themselves, Quran washed them. Quran removed them from darkness to light. And those who were the worst in that time, they became the best of the best because now they have different scripture and different guide. There's no way for a person to buy a device and go home with it without a manual. There's no way for you to buy a car without a key to put in ignition and turn it on. There's no way for you to go outside and buy a computer or any device without a manual. Likewise, Quran serves as a manual for the world, accepted or denied, repudiated, welcome or rejected. It remains as the central guide for the world, not only Muslims. That being said, if people take this scripture, read it, apply it, and learn the call that Almighty place in this scripture is enough to change ourselves in less than nine seconds. If we apply the book, not only read, not only recite, and not only to impress people or recite beautifully for people to enjoy. Not about enjoyment, not listening when he is reciting what is it that Almighty is telling us. This is the most important. Not the nice voice, not how beautiful it sounds, no, what is the call? That is the most important when it comes to the scripture of Almighty, sublime and exalted be he. So in today's lecture, I will share with you some indications. I will share with you some guidelines that if you internalize within you, within your family, within your, among your friends, within your society, in your community, and also on the land or in the land that you live on, guess what? You'll be an icon. You will be like a bacon. You'll be the light of people, especially if you have Quran that translates itself from inside to outside. So Muslims, don't just take it and recite it beautifully. No, recite and see what is it that Almighty is asking. According to the father of this nation, Jemu Kenyatta, and according to Demons Tutu, the West or the South African cleric, both said, when the missionaries arrived in Africa, the colonial, the master, those who came from Europe, when they arrived in Africa to rape the land and remove and take with them the resources, both said, when the missionaries arrived in Africa, they had the Bible and we have the land. I want you to pay attention, brothers. And sisters, pay attention here. When the missionaries arrived, they have the Bible, and we have what? We have the land. Then they ask us to pray with them. They teach us how to pray with them. So when we started praying with them, they taught us to pray with our eyes closed. So we did. We started praising the Lord in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Praising the God. Praising Jesus. With our eyes what? Brothers with our eyes what? Sisters with our eyes what? Closed. So as we start to pray with our eyes closed, we prayed for a very long time. By the time we opened our eyes, they handed the Bible to us and they have the land. That's exactly what happened. By the time we open our eyes, now they have the land, and we have what? The Bible. So as we were praying with our eyes closed, did they close their eyes? Did they? They didn't. So this is the only scripture, the only book revealed 
by Almighty as the seal of all scriptures and books that were revealed before. And Quran asks us that when we read, or Almighty instructs us that when we recite, we should not recite with our eyes closed. And the eyes closed here does not mean literally closing your eyes and reading. No, when you read, make sure your heart is in it, your mind is in it. Whatever you read, your mind will bring it to your heart. The heart will translate it and bring it out for your own benefit. So Muslims in 21st century, if you only recite Quran and read Quran without knowing what the contents of the book contains or what is that the Almighty is saying in Quran, you only recite to impress yourself or you recite to impress others or you recite for people to enjoy, guess what? We will be just like Jim Yadi said. We will be just like Tutu said. We will wind up having the book, the best book in the world, yet we are subordinate. Is that what is happening to Muslims around the world or not? When the world, we as Muslims, have the best scripture, have the best example that ever walked on the face of earth, yet we are in the back. Yet we are not active, yet socially dysfunctional, yet we have no direction to take us back to the empowerment and ascendancy or the betterment that our predecessors left for us as legacy. What happened? What happened is this. We go and graduate from whatever institutions of knowledge or Islamic universities. When we return back, when we teach, we do not use the words from that scripture to change our lives. We only pray and feel good. In Ramadan, what they ask for an imam to come and lead, they say, hey, imam, make sure you get a bulbul for us. When he reads, people feel good. If you bring an imam, he has the best makharij al huruf in the world and does not have nice voice, the board members will tell you that, hey, brother imam, you know, we don't want you here more. We want someone with that nice voice. So it tends to be just enjoyment, just edutainment. That's not the purpose of Quran. And that's why when you read Quran, you don't have to be a hafiz or a hafiz memorizing the entire scripture from Fatiha to Birabbin Nas. You don't have to memorize Quran to be a unique person as a Muslim or as a Muslim. No. The only thing you need to learn how to recite that book properly and also learn that language to understand the call of Almighty directly and even if that will be one verse that you will use to change yourself, change your son, change your daughter, change your wife, change your father, change your mother, change your society, change your friend, change your community and conclusively change the nation that is going through poverty or is going through turmoil or is going through affliction with one verse is enough for the world to return back to prosperity and peace. And that's why we see in the ahadith of Rasulullah it is mentioned according to Imam Abu Dharr the Sahabi Jund ibn Junada Abu Dharr al-Ghifari said I witnessed Prophet peace be upon him one day praying at night he was praying at night. The young boy who is looking over there, that young boy in the middle, what, what is the name of the companion I just mentioned? What's the name of that companion? And those in the back, holding phones and playing video games and angry birds, y'all put them phones and get something, go home with that tomorrow. So you did not come here and see the crowd. You came here for Quran to make, you know, some changes or impacts, empower yourself and go home with it. So I want you to pay attention. That's why the father brought you here. And the young ones also from this side, likewise. And we ask Almighty to, bl to bless this journey of faith that allowed us to convene and share all these experiences that our scholars came with from all walks of life. I mean, back to the topic. Attention to be paid. Listen attentively. Again, Abu Dharr al-Ghifari, he said, I witnessed Prophet praying at night. He recited Ayah 118, Chapter 5, Surah Al-Uqud. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Almighty says, In to Abibuhum, for in Nahum Ibaduk, wa in Tafir Lawum, for in Naka Antal Azizul Hakim. 
This is only one verse, 118 of chapter 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah or Uqud. Prophet stood up at night. He repeated this verse back and back from the beginning of his prayer all the way to the end. More than seven hours he is praying with one verse, thinking through with what will happen upon his ummah or to his ummah on the day of judgment. One verse that caused him to pause. Think deeply and see what is it that Almighty is telling him. What is that communication? One verse. In Quran, we have more than 6,230 verses, yet he picked one, even though he has all Quran together. And it is also mentioned that Tamim ad dari another companion, a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu uh, alayhi the young boy with the coat. What's the name of the companion? And you know, I'm, I'm flying back to US anyway tonight, so you are going to deal with the organizers in case I cause trouble. <laughs> so, Tamimu Dari, he prayed at night and he recited chapter 45, Surah Sharia or Jathiyah, verse 21. Am hasib al ladhina jitarahu sayyat. Do those who wrong themselves, do those who committed sins and prodigal against themselves by going against the will of Almighty, do they think that we will make them equal to those who believe in Allah and act righteously? Will they be equal? My asking brothers, the evil people and the good people, are they equal? Sisters, those who wrong themselves and those who do not, are they the same? Never will they be the same. Quran said, Tamim Dari recited this verse in front of Kaaba. Do you know what happened? He repeated the same verse for more than five hours, praying at night in Salat al Tahajjud. How did he learn this? From who? From who? From Prophet, peace be upon him, he learned it. And here is Abdullah ibn Umar, peace be upon him. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he prayed one day. When he started making his salat of tahajjud, he opened surah al-Furqan, that's chapter 25. When he reached ayah number 13, وَإِذَا أُلْقُوا مِنْهَا مَكَانًا ضَيِّقًا مُقَرَّنِينَ دَعَوْ هُنَالِكَ ثُبُورًا When he reached on this verse, when he reached to it, he stopped. And he started repeating the verse. People said, were you to see Abdullah ibn Umar on that day, you may think that he is out of his mind or he lost his memory. Thank you very much, brother. In American, we say thank you very much, you say walk. Barakallahu <laughs> feek. <laughs> so, back to Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar, he recited ayah 13 for, throughout the night prayer. Just thinking deep. How many verses is that? Only one. Just like Prophet used one. Just like Tamim ad daddy used one. And here is another companion, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was known as faqih of a sahaba, well acquainted jurist among sahaba. In knowledge, he the top, or one of the top sahaba in ilm. He recited ayah 114 of chapter 20, surah Taha. When he reached the verse where Almighty talked about knowledge, and he understood that knowledge is power, just like Frederick Douglass said back in, you know, in 1800s that knowledge is power this actually came from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud not from Douglas so Abdullah ibn Mas'ud knew that knowledge is power when he recited this verse he did not change he kept on repeating the same verse. Oh Allah, increase me in knowledge. Oh Lord, advance me in knowledge. Because if you have knowledge you have what? You have what? You have power, you have influence, you can rule and you can lead. And according to, you know, Marcus Garvey, he said, you have to know that knowledge leads and ignorance pays the price of the burden. You want me to use it? 
Okay, you know, if I hold this, I can't make the movement, you know. See, don't worry, you know, people can hear it. I have amplifier here. Okay, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much again. You say welcome. <laughs> so, so this is what happened. One ayah, Abdullah Mas'ud repeated. Who remembers what the ayah is? Advance me in knowledge, increase me in knowledge. He repeated it many, many times. And here is another companion, well-known Sahabi. He also stood up at night to recite Quran. He followed the same thing that Tamim al did. He did the same thing that Abdullah ibn Umar did. He did the same thing that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud did. One verse, back to back, just to think. Because Quran is not about how many verses you will recite. It's not about how many verses you read. No, it's the impact that Quran has on you. And also the impact that Quran brings to your life. That's all what matters. If a person recites from Baqarah all the way to Birab bin Nas, yet does not understand, this is not the purpose of Quran. One verse, you understand it, articulate it well, apply it, change yourself with it, help others to understand it, and change your society with it. That's the main purpose of Quran being revealed. It is also mentioned on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abd Qais Amir رضي الله عنه وكان من سادات التابعين توفي في خلافة معاوية ابن أبي سفيان so this tabi'i the student of companion known as Abdullah ibn Abd Qais Amir he recited Quran one day at night in his night prayer and he recited Surah Al-Mu'min or Ghafir Hamim that surah, Ghafir, Surah Al-Mu'min, that's chapter 40. When he reached ayah 17 and 18, he paused right there. Do you know what that ayah is? Who can give a guess? Brothers, sisters, you want to guess? Y'all get Google to show you who Y'all get Bing, y'all can Bing it. You get ask.com, y'all can ask.com. From verse 18, he recited, وَأَنذِرُهُمْ يَوْمَ الْآزِفَةِ إِذِ الْقُلُوبُ لَدَ الْحَنَاجِرِ كَاظِمِينَ مَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ حَمِيمٍ وَلَا شَفِيعٍ يُطَاعٍ Meaning, warn the masses, warn people about the day of Al-Azifa. The day of Al-Azifa is the day of judgment. The day of judgment has many names. It's called Yawm al 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 It's also called Yawm al as well as Yawm al It is called Al-Azifa because in Arabic, when something is close, becomes closer than close, it's called Azifa. So Azifa till Azifa, that which is nigh had driven nigh than nigh. At that which is close had become closer than close. That's the meaning of Aziva. So the day of judgment is closer than people think. It's closer than we even per presume or think. Oh, Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala call it the day of Aziva. On that day, what will happen? Almighty oh, said, Idil qulubu ladal hanajiri kathimeen. What will happen on that day is people's heart, our heart will be asked to make a move. The heart will come out and come all the way to our throat and choke us. Can you believe it? Do you know the reason why these two body parts, the heart and the throat? Now we know the throat is the vehicle of what? Sound. And the heart is the plate of passion and love. So now on that day, to cancel the equation of love and passion and caring, and also those who will think they will lie, Almighty Allah will charge the hearts to pop up and come all the way to the throat to choke people so people can't talk until they are permitted. Kings cannot speak. Governors can't speak. Leaders of the world can't speak unless permitted. Nobody can say a word. So this is what Almighty said about that verse. That hearts will choke people. So this Imam Amir ibn Abd Qais, he decided this verse, he became confused. That now I'm holding my hands this way and I'm reading Quran and this chest that I place my hand on, a day will come that the chest will pop up and choke me. Aki started crying throughout the night, repeating the verse until Mu'addin make adhan for Fajr. 
That's how they understood Quran. That's the scripture to them. It's not just to recite many, many verses and don't understand what is it that you're reading. Because that's what makes difference in your life and also the life that you want to live comfortably and also successfully. Quran has the guide all together. So that's why those people, whenever they read, they do not jump faster. And that's why Imam Abu Jamrah, he said, a man came to Abdullah ibn Abbasin, radiallahu anhuma, tarjuman al-Qur'an, wa ibn Ammi Rasulillah. Abdullah ibn Abbas was well-known scholar among the Sahaba. When it comes to Qur'an, he the top. When it comes to the interpretation of Qur'an, they gave him the flag that he is on the top among even the Sahaba, regardless of his young age. So this man came and he said, sometimes at night I recite Surah Al-Baqarah and al Imran in one raka'ah. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, well, may Allah reward you, but for me to recite one surah and understand what Almighty Allah is saying, for me to repeat that surah back and back forth, back, back, going back, coming back, going deep, coming up, making ruku' the same number of minutes and going to sujood the same number of minutes for me to do this, thinking deeply about the scripture is better than for me to recite many, many ayat and don't understand what is it that Almighty is talking about because then I can't change my life because then I will be confused. So if I will recite even few, it's better than that. It is mentioned that Imam Abi Zahiriya, he said a man came to Imam Al Abu Darda, a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, with his son, and he said, "Oh Imam," he said, "Oh Imam, Granddaddy, can you come here a minute? Come on, Granddaddy." I call him Granddaddy because his name is Hassan, and that's the name of my grandfather. So I call him Granddaddy. How you doing? A man came with his son like this, like Al Hassan. So he said, Imam, guess what? My son, he already half. My son, he captured Quran done. And very powerful memory, very smart and intelligent. Do you know what Abu Darda? Do you know what he said? He said, Rabbi Ghfir, may Allah have mercy and forgive. The one who is considered as Hafid in our time, the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a Hafid among us is not someone who memorized the entire book. No, a Hafid among us is someone who reads Quran, understands the meaning, and applies it in his daily life. That is a Hafid. And your son is too young to even get to that level. And you going around talking about he's a Hafid? Now, do, how many Hufas that we have today? I'm asking, how many Hufas around the world? Granddad, you want to have a good time with me here? Or you want to sit down? You want to leave me sweat by myself? No. Okay, go have a seat. If I need you, I'll call you back. But then change the seat and don't hide. You see? What was the last thing I said, brothers and sisters? <laughs> not, not hide that's granddaddy. I'm talking about in the lecture. Huh? A half with well half. You see, the sisters always on point, take one. May Allah reward them. See, so half is just like well half is doing a little do those who preserve the laws and the precepts of Quran to them are the Hufad. But you read and you don't understand what is it that you read. See. The number of Hufad we have today around the world is like double, double, and super, cooper double than the number of the Sahaba. But do we have the same impact like them? Sahaba, till they passed away, the number of the Hufad of Quran from Baqarah to Rabbi Nas is not even one-tenth of what we have today. But do we have the same impact? Do we have the same impact in the world like them when they were alive? So what is the difference? So then it's not about memorization of the book. It's not about just reading it. It's what the book is doing in your life. It's what makes you a half of that book. Hassan al-Basri said that 
when it comes to Quran, the one awla nasi bil Quran, the levi taba ahu wa illam yakra. The one who is qualified to be of those people of Quran is he or she who follows the calls of Quran, even if that person did not have it memorized. That's the main point. Understand it? And I'm not belittling the issue of memorizing Quran. One of the best gifts in the world is for a person to be a hafiz. That's a gift. But the purpose is not just be a hafiz and sit. No, take it to the next level. That is what it's all about. So that's how they understood Quran, and that's how they move. And to our sisters, if you will recall here, Asma bint Abi Bakr, as Siddiqa bint Siddiq, Asma. The, oh, the sister of Umm al Aisha, she recited Surah At-Tur one day. Now, sisters, listen to this here. She recited Surah At-Tur. When she recited Surah At-Tur, she reached on Ayah 27, where Almighty says, فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا وَوَقَانَا عَذَابَ السَّمُونَ Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala had favored us, and he had showered his bountiful favor upon us, and he also, Allah, had saved us from the scorching fire, from from the amount that Almighty had reserved for the people who disobeyed him in fire, that scorching fire, we are saved from it as Muslims. Now, Asma bin to Abi Bakr, when she recited it, she started repeating, وَوَقَانَا عَذَابَ السَّمُومِ وَوَقَانَا عَذَابَ السَّمُومِ Reciting this and crying, shedding tears for more than three hours. Just, وَوَقَانَا عَذَابَ السَّمُومِ Back Repeating it over and over because that's what she believes is changing her life. So to our sisters, don't think that, you know, whenever we talk, we say brothers and brothers, you are, not, you are excluded. No, you are well included. It doesn't matter whether it's in the masculine form and it's not in the feminine form. No, the call of Quran encompasses everyone. So here is your sister, Asma bint Abi Bakr, repeating, and she left this as a legacy for the world after her departure. So when it comes to this dean, sisters, you're also on the top of the list. And standing up to learn is just following the methodology of your mother, Umm al muminin and our mother all together, as siddiqa to bintu siddiq. Now we know in Sahih, of Imam in Nasa'i, in the Sunan of Imam al Nasa'i, on the authority of Imam Muhammad ibn Bashar, on the authority of Yahya, son of Sa'id, from Qatada, on the authority of Zurara, on the authority of Hisham, Ibn Sa'ad or Sa'ad ibn Amir, who came to Umm al Mu'minin Aisha radiallahu an. But when he came to talk to her, he does not have no connection. So he went to Abdullah ibn Abbas. He said, I know you are closer to her than Amir. Or then Sa'ad ibn Hisham, will you please go to the mother of the believers and ask her that I want to ask some things about the religion? Why? Because she was a scholar of that time. And even Abdullah, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib said, sometimes when we get confused about the religion, we dash to Umm al Mu'minina Aisha and Imam Sa'id. Al Khudri, Abu Sa'id al Khudri, the companion, he said, whenever we get confused about some fiqh issue, we go to Umm al Mu'minina Aisha. So, Umm al Mu'minina Aisha, when the man came, Abdullah ibn Abbas said, Allah una bi uka, bi a'lami ahli al ardi, bi witiri Rasulullah. Do you want me to appoint the most knowledgeable person, the most affluent person when it comes to the religion of Islam, special with the witter of Rasulullah, he said yes. Then he pointed at Aisha's house. He said she is the one. And that's why Imam Shamsuddin al-Dahabi radiallahu an was reported to have said وَلَا أَعْلَمُ مْرَأَةً عَلَى وَجْهِ الْأَرْضِ أَعْلَمَ مِنْ عائشة. I don't know of any woman on the face of this earth who is more knowledgeable than Aisha. So my sister, she is your own leader in this. So try to strive. Before she passed away, she memorized more than 2,000, more than 2,010 a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by memory. And she said, when I was six, I was playing in the city. When the verse came, she said, I was only six, but I have it memorized. And I have it in my memory till today. So our sisters, your 
own ambition when it comes to this dean to learn and also preserve the legacy of this dean you are also ahead of the curve don't just sit and think well all the time is brothers when we go to pray in masjid you know brothers are in front and sisters sometimes on the top or sometimes in the back this is the system systematically left us a legacy for us by our prophet we can change it and we believe that's the best scenario but being in the back does not mean that when it comes to speeding to Allah, you're way behind. And one lady, one lady, during the time of Al-Mu'tasim, she shouted because a non-believer disrespected her and he pulled her hijab. What did he do? What did he do? Sisters, what did he do? He pulled her hijab. Now in different places you can get away with this, but in Philly you will never get away with that. So in any case, he pulled her hijab. What? A Muslimah? And then she shouted, Wa mu'tasimah, meaning she is calling upon the Khalifa of that time when she said, Wa mu'tasimah. When she called his name, Wa mu'tasimah, the Khalifa of that time said, that means this lady, she is in trouble and she needs our help. Right away, he asked the army, he did not say, go and check what's going on. He said, ask the army, discharge the armies to save that sister because the voice of a sister is just like thousand people who have no iman between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go and rescue that sister. And they learned the lesson that a Muslim woman should not be played with. And also during the time of Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf, a lady was captured among the captives of the time. And then she screamed, Wa Hajjaj. Hajjaj said, Where is Muhammad Ibn Al Qasim Al Fadl, the leader of the army, the commander in chief? He said, The sister is in trouble. She wants and help. Do you know what happened? He caused 6,000 troops to go and rescue just that sister. One sister. And they went. When they went, the king of sin said, well, those who captured that lady, you know, we have no power over them. And we cannot do anything. And even the government that they supposed to be obeying, they're not obeying. So there's nothing for us to do. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf said, well, if y'all can't do anything, guess what? We take care of it for you and we will bring peace in that land. That's when he discharged the speed of cheater and also the claw of Kamulan dragon, and that's when you see the teeth of Jaguar and Cheetah, and that's when you see the speed, 65 miles per hour, of Friglin Parkin arriving on them, snatching them, and they took the sister from them, and they took the other non Muslims that were also captured. So when they left, the non Muslim sister said, You just called Wahajaj, and all these people came. How did you get that in your system? She said, that's how Islam is all about. It's about power. It's about intelligence. It's about empowerment. It's about social what? Informants. And also it changes people. And if I'm in it, wherever I am around the world, when I cry, people should come for me. Guess what happened? She caused the people of Sindh all together to embrace Islam. Tarakta fu'ad al-kufri bi Sindh ta'ira. So a sister caused the people of sin to embrace Islam. What are you doing for this country also as a sister, a Muslim who lives in Kenya? So to our youth, to the youth of Kenya, may Allah bless you in Akhirah and Dunya. You are the representatives of this Muslim Ummah and not dead as they claim like Patrice Lalumba, Kwame Nkrumah, or the Horn of Mentezuma. Stop the intruder, come out as a cougar in the land of Puma and be the source of peace in the world and also the cure for malignant tumor. That's what Islam gave us. That's the power that Islam gave Muslims if only if we take the cause of Quran because Prophet Ali salatu wasalam, he left it as a legacy and the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were not just regular people, they were not just people of you know, piety, or people of Iman, or people of Yaqeen. No, those Sahaba, during their time in piety, 
they were number one. And also, situation of how to deal with the environment and how to lead, they were also on the top. Economically, that Dr. Iha had been pushing for you to get and for all of us to benefit from Sahaba, they were on the top. Do you think Abu Bakr was just a layman? who believed in prophet, he was Sayyid Bani Tamim. He was the leader of his own people, billionaire of the time. What do you think of Uthman ibn Affan? He was billionaire, if not trillionaire of that time. What do you think of Sa'ad ibn Sa Sa'ad and also Sa'id? What do you think of those two? They were, were all pioneers of leadership when it comes to economics. Why? Because they understood that the vehicle of Islam will never run at the top of speed without wealth, without money, without influence, without being socially connected. But Muslims, for the most part, we are in the religion, powerful and connected. But socially, when you look at us, we are dysfunctional. And that's why we are in the back of the seat and others are taking the lead. That's not what Prophet did. And that's not what Quran is asking us. We're supposed to be ahead of the curve. Wherever people curve, they should see us right in front of them. A Muslim is the one taking the leadership position, not being subordinate. That's the message that Quran gave us. So with Quran, use Quran for the benefit of this country. Use Quran for the empowerment of this country. Use the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to empower the Muslims of Kenya, to empower the non-Muslims of Kenya, to empower the people that live and breathe the same fragrance of your own land. Imagine, we are informed that a lady, a woman, Hadith in Bukhari, in Sahih al-Bukhari, a woman who was known as prostitute. She was selling her dignity. She just committing adultery. That's all what she knows as profession. What happened? Long story short, and I believe that you know the hadith, and all of you had heard it before, but I'm bringing it because there's a point that I want to make here, other than what probably or peradventure you are used to. This lady, she came after she had concluded the job of the night. She sold her dignity, she sold herself, and she prostituted herself when she finished on her way to her home. What did she see? She saw a dog that is lolling its own tongue. There's no water for the dog to benefit from. What happened? The lady, that prostitute, she saw that, you know, dog, and she said, indeed, this dog is actually asking for water. It's, it's to be quenched, and the thirst should be quenched because the dog has no what water to drink. What did she do? She removed whatever sandals she was wearing, and she went under a well. She went in that well and get some water. And she came out, and she bowed down. She gave it to that. Now, this is the children of Bani Israel coming down, feeding that dog when she fed that dog. Now, the thirst of that dog is quenched. She is not even a worshiper. She is just a sinner who is committing adultery or fornication every night. But Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he realized that all, oh, when Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala sees from her heart the love and also the mercy and the passion for that dog, what did Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala do? What did Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala do for that lady? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Almighty forgave all the previous sins that she committed and also he appreciated that act. Now there's two things. For Allah to forgive you but may not appreciate what you did. But he forgave what she did and he appreciated what she did. And by the way, Dogs, during that time, it's not like dogs in the Western world where a dog will have a house, a dog will have a shelter, a dog can sleep on a sofa, a dog can sleep on a king-size bed or queen-size bed. No, it's not like that. Guess what? During their time, dogs have no respect or no caring whatsoever. But this lady, she was able to feed that dog and also provide the water. Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave her and all what she had done in the past is forgiven. And Almighty Allah admitted her into paradise and Jannah. So now uh, you have heard of this hadith, no doubt before. But guess what? If this was a prostitute who washed the dog and took care of the dog and Allah forgave her, what will Allah do for you if you take a prostitute and wash her up?
What will you do if, or if you take someone, a young child in the street of Kenya who has no education? The mother is begging and the child supposed to be in school, but the mother has nothing to do or nothing to pay for the tuition of that child. You say to the mother, we give you this and take those young kids from the street and educate them for them to be the light of the future here in Kenya. That's the call of Quran. I just started my topic. I didn't even get to the middle yet, but my time is up. I just started warming up. <laughs> but, you know, the time that I said is up, and I will not like to go beyond. So this is what we said. I ask you to remember what we mentioned earlier, that according to Vincent Thomas, the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. The reason why success comes before work in the dictionary is because S comes before what? W. So the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. Other than that, if you don't put work, you will never succeed. And according to Benjamin Franklin, well done is better than well said. To do it well is better than to say it well. And according to Vince Lombardi, quitters never win and winners never quit. And according to Dr. Martin Luther King, in order for you to excel and be on the top of your countrymen, you have to remember the following. You have to fly. If you cannot fly, run. If you cannot run, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. Don't be stagnant. That's the message that we brought to you from Philly, not Chile. So don't deal with it like Big Willie. Thank you very much for your time. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.